The DeKalb County Free Fall Fair was coming off a great year. The plans were being made throughout the year for an even better fair the next year. And then in the summer, something changed. A viral outbreak gripped Indiana, worse in the northern part of the state. People used words like scare and dread. And just two weeks before the fair was to be held, a decision had to be made. The fair would be canceled. The year was 1940 and the virus was polio. But so much of the story that year, the fair was canceled, rings familiar to our own ears 80 years later. This is the story told in newspaper accounts of the day of how a virus brought down a long-standing yearly tradition in DeKalb County. On Friday, January 19, 1940, the Fair Association met to elect officers for the new year and to hear from the treasurer, Harry Caspier, on how the 1939 fair had done financially, and it had done exceptionally well. Earl Stimmen, the first vice president, offered his thanks to the people of DeKalb County for their cooperation in a record-breaking fair. The Auburn Street Department was thanked for their help in blocking off streets for the fair. Record participation in 4-H exhibits was predicted, and it was hoped that the free fair would continue to host the District Dairy Show, an innovation in 1939. Not only was the fair record-breaking, it had turned a profit of over $1,500, approximately $28,000 in 2020. This was no small feat coming out of the years of the Great Depression. In January, the new officers were formally elected. The membership must have thought well of the 1939 president because they re-elected H.E. Hart to the office. He was joined by Noah Yoder of Auburn as first vice president and Dr. F.A. Hall, a veterinarian of Garrett, as second vice president. Bus Hetrick of Jackson Township was the secretary and John Haggerty of Auburn became the new treasurer. As 1940 went on, these men would find themselves making decisions they would never have considered in January. Apparently some of those January plans were coming to fruition. By late March, the Garrett Clipper was reporting that Professor J.B. Fitch would be returning to judge the Northeastern Indiana Cattle Show. Professor Fitch had grown up in Auburn, but was now teaching at the University of Minnesota. He had judged the 1939 district show, which had proven such a success. Breeders from Adams, Whitley, Allen, Elkhart, and DeKalb were planning to show animals. Others would be invited. Not everyone was excited about a bigger fair. Residents of the streets that had held the livestock exhibits in front of their homes wanted a change of location. By the beginning of July, plans were firming up. Because the fair was starting a day earlier, it would end promptly at midnight on Saturday, October 5th. First Vice President Noah Yoder bought the first ticket. Any family that bought a 50 cent membership could exhibit at the fair. This was a way to encourage as many exhibits as possible and to offset fair costs. All of the industrial tent exhibitors were returning. 4-H2 was enjoying a boom year. The pig club alone had 135 members. The poultry division asked for more space. They had been too cramped in 1939. The county veterinarians all offered their services to provide free testing to those who would show calves to make sure they were free of brucellosis, a highly contagious disease among cattle. This was no small undertaking. The dairy show was expecting well over 300 head of cattle in all breeds from across Northeast Indiana. Health was clearly on the minds of the fair board. The preparations were also shadowed by a death. Eileen Kirkpatrick of Auburn, who was active in local Girl Scouting and the liaison to the fair for that organization, had been killed that week in an auto accident in Michigan. Those present at the meeting gave her a moment of silence in recognition for her work. Later in the month, it was announced that the fair would add a contest for County Fair Queen. The winner would be decided by popular vote. News of the DeKalb County Free Fall Fair 
was of course not the only news in the papers those days. In early August, a national story told of the newest discoveries about how polio could be spread. Poliomyelitis, also known as infantile paralysis, was a virus that seemed to appear haphazardly every year in the summer. The causes were unknown, though there was speculation. While it was called infantile paralysis, the virus had no age limits. Nineteen years earlier, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had contracted polio at age 39. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis was the leading researcher in causes, treatments, and a cure for the disease. On August 7th, they released a news story that researchers from the United States Department of Public Health, the Michigan Health Department, and the Detroit Public Health Department had discovered that during a polio epidemic, children who seemed to be healthy could in fact be carriers of the virus and infect other children. It gave American parents a whole new reason to be terrified. A small news brief about a camp in Kosciuszko County was probably overlooked by most readers. The story next to it that began on the front page would have been of far more immediate attention to many. Germany was already one year into its takeover of Europe. But there, a small news brief out of Warsaw was the beginning of a story that would hold the attention of Northern Indiana all that fall. A teenager from South Bend attending a Presbyterian church camp at Winona Lake had fallen ill with polio. She died 48 hours later. The Kosciuszko acting health officer, Dr. O.H. Richard, ordered the camp closed and all 175 campers sent home for a 10-day quarantine. Gwendolyn Paul was the fourth case of polio in the county that summer. The National Infantile Paralysis Foundation was shipping splints and other rehabilitation equipment to counties around Indiana in case of need. Splinting paralyzed arms and legs as soon as possible was seen as the best way to counteract permanent paralysis. Meanwhile, plans for the county fair were still progressing. Building on the success of the 1939 fair, 1940 had lots of new areas of competition and the cash prizes were larger. Domestic arts and fine arts were now separate areas. New competition classes had been added in hobbies and antiques. There was a new artificial flowers category as well as categories for dresses, pajamas, and housecoats. Painters could enter oil, watercolor, and pastel works for the first time. There were also competitions for photographers and potters. It was all looking very promising. That same week, articles published with an Indianapolis Dateline had Dr. Vern K. Harvey, director of the State Department of Health, express hope that cooler weather would end the current polio outbreak. At that time, there were 75 known cases, most in St. Joseph and Elkhart counties, August 20th, 1940. Two days later, the case count was up to 148 statewide and school openings were being pushed back in areas with the highest case counts. Dr. Harvey added that Indiana had not been hit as hard as some other states. On Tuesday, August 27th, photographers in DeKalb County were being told to go take a hike or a drive if they wanted to display pictures in that year's fair. The theme was landscapes of DeKalb County. That same Tuesday, the state health department was reporting a decrease in polio cases, though two of the cases mentioned in a news article that day were particularly heart-wrenching. A school teacher in Cherubusco died at an Indianapolis hospital. At the same hospital, an 18-year-old new mother gave birth to a three-pound baby by C-section. She had to be removed from an iron lung long enough for the surgery. The iron lung did the breathing for her lungs that her polio-paralyzed muscles could not. By Thursday, August 29th, the news had changed dramatically. More cases and deaths were reported. High schools in St. Joseph County were canceling football games. By the end of that last week in August, the disease had made an appearance in Huntington County. A 10-year-old girl had died and school openings were delayed by two weeks. The Huntington County Health Commissioner closed churches and banned public gatherings. That same day, teachers in Steuben County were talking about two cases of polio in their county. The county health officer, Dr. Lane, saw no need to delay school openings. The Angola Herald newspaper opined that everyone hopes there will be no more cases. That weekend was Labor Day. 
The following week proved especially virulent for polio cases. The September 5, 1940, Garrett Clipper carried a snippet of news in ways that community papers of that era often did, of a rumor. Boss Hattrick, the Fair Association secretary, tried to lay the rumor to rest by assuring readers that two amusement companies had committed to the fair, proven by the bonds that they had posted at a local bank. The fair would go on. That same Thursday, more polio articles were documenting the continuing march of the epidemic in Indiana. The director of admissions at the Indiana University Medical Center said all six of the hospital's ventilators were in use and two more had been requested from Chicago. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis had gone into overdrive to send assistance to what was now clearly an epidemic in Indiana. Iron lungs were sent to Indiana hospitals to more than double the amount available at the beginning of the outbreak. Splints and bed frames were made available. And on that same day, schools across Marshall County were pushing back openings until September 16th. It would later be pushed back once more until September 30th. And also on September 5th, the Garrett Clipper carried a story of a newlywed woman who was on a respirator three weeks after her wedding. Having laid to rest the previous week's rumors of the fair being canceled, the fair committee released their plans for several parades over the course of fair week. The fair opened on a Monday, which was a change from the usual Tuesday tradition. On Monday evening, there would be a good fellowship parade to kick things off. All of the local schools were sending bands to the youth parade on Friday, a day schools would be closed. That would also be the day for the scout parade. Saturday morning would be the pet parade, where children had to accompany their cats, dogs, ponies, or other small animals. And later that day, the industrial parade was planned. The week of September 12th included stories about more polio cases and more deaths. The epidemic was about to come home to DeKalb County. On September 18th, the newspaper reported on the first case in DeKalb County. The previous week, a 16-year-old junior at Garrett High School was reported to have a mild case. Her family was placed under a strict quarantine. The Garrett Clipper that week reported that there were over 400 known cases in Indiana and that an in-depth scientific study was being done to give a full picture of the epidemic. On Monday, September 16th, the DeKalb County Free Fall Fair Association made a decision of their own. The Fair Board and the Auburn City Council met to make the decision. Before going into their closed session, they heard from representatives across the county. A petition signed by 200 community members and many local organizations led off the meeting. H.M. Messenger of North Main Street in Auburn was the first speaker. He presented the petition and explained that there was no malice held toward the fair board, but that the mothers of the community had taken it up as a question of public health in the community with a sincere and earnest attempt to protect the health of the children as much as possible. He also noted the counter argument that since Auburn had had no cases as of then, the fair could go forward, observing that due to the epidemic, attendance was projected to be way down. I don't think that we should take money matters into consideration when human life is endangered, Messenger said. Robert Schooley, a teacher, noted that though he could keep his kids home from the fair, he couldn't prevent them from being around other kids at school who would have gone to the fair and then exposed his own children. I feel strongly that for one year, the fair should be put aside, he said. Louis Strauss of West 14th Street asked that the movie theaters and other public gathering spots also be closed, doing the job 100% instead of just 50. The Waterloo School Superintendent Charles Overmeyer was eloquent. I feel responsible for 378 children. We don't know the cause of the disease, but since we do not know, we must avoid any chance of spreading it. Mrs. A.V. Hinson of South Main Street offered the feeling that if cases developed in Auburn, not only should the fair be canceled, but theaters, churches, schools, and other public meeting places should be closed. W.H. Williner of North Main Street spoke from a business point of view. We are facing a serious proposition. No one wants to take the responsibility of having the fair with the possibility that infantile paralysis may result. 
there is a well-conceived notion that crowds aid the spread of the disease. He felt that the responsibility for calling off the fair should rest with the health department, not the city council or the fair association. Mrs. E. F. Fribley, a resident of rural DeKalb County, had circulated the petition among farm families. Almost all of them had told her they supported calling off the fair. Buss Hetrick, the fair association secretary, was not going to give up without making a strong case for why he believed the fair should go on. He cited that medical authorities did not know how the disease was spread. He noted that the state fair had not been canceled, nor had some other county fairs. He argued that a great deal of money had been spent already on preparing for the fair. And then he brought in the 4-H exhibitors, whom, he noted, had been working hard all year to make a good showing at the fair. Mrs. George Oberlin had a daughter who had been through polio 20 years earlier. Speaking from first-hand knowledge, she begged the City Council and Fair Association to cancel the fair. The City Council voted to declare a state of emergency due to the epidemic of infantile paralysis. This was done to protect the Fair Association from possible lawsuits if they canceled. At that point, the Fair Board moved to a private room to continue their meeting. When they emerged, the vote was 17 to 4 in favor of canceling the fair. The polio cases in Northeast Indiana did not immediately abate. On the same day the newspaper was reporting the canceling of the fair, another case in DeKalb County made headlines. In October, the Fair Association Board met and decided to make plans for a 1941 fair. A story on December 26, 1940, called it the worst year in Indiana history for cases of polio. Civic organizations like the Kiwanis were being urged to mobilize in fighting the disease. After another year of making plans and the world around them continuing to change, on September 29, 1941, the DeKalb County Fair came back.